Good day. Welcome to Strong Ambition Podcast. Today, we're going to dive into mental resilience with Alyssa Van Alstein. Now, Alyssa went to university with me way back in the day, and I didn't know her very well back then, but I remember seeing her in the classes. And then later on, I would run into her as she married one of my friends from university, Jace. And me and Jace would hang out here and there, and he would mention that his wife had some health issues. I was unaware of what they were, but I just knew she was always battling something in the background. And then today we got to sync up and have an amazing conversation about her incredible journey. She had more health issues than I had any idea, and she has an amazing mindset that pulled her through it. So today she's going to take you on a journey and explain to you what she had to go through and the mindset that she had to be able to overcome it and how she's able to help her clients and business utilize better mindsets. So I'll let Alyssa tell her story. Without further ado, here is Alyssa Van Alstein. Good day, Alyssa. Great to have you today. How are you, ma'am? Oh, doing so good, Rylan. Such an honor to be here and with you and your audience. Well, thank you for honoring us with your with your grace. So I want to dive into this. I don't do a, a massive intro because I want you to tell your story. And I know you got a really cool one. So give us a rough overview and then we'll dive more into the details. Tell everyone who you are, what you do, and how you got to do what you're doing now. Mm, beautiful. My name is Alyssa Van Alstein. My company is Alyssa Van Alstein International. Doing life and business coaching is, I love focusing on business because it brings up a lot of stuff when you're building business. Um, but first of all, me and my story, and my story is really, I've come to embrace it and love every single kind of mountain and every pitfall that we've been on or that I've been on. And it's really, it's, it's been fun. There's been a lot of health, health stuff coming up. So we went to university together. I don't really remember it because I had a major concussion at the time. That's when all of my stuff happened. So yes, I mean, my, my husband too, he was with us there. So <laughs> super funny. There's so many different ways we could go just from that. But um, yeah, that's when I first slipped and fell and had a major concussion, spinal injury. And I was an athlete at the time. I was uh, in university, kinesiology, transferred out of athletic therapy. And, and it just got worse. And it was really, really amazing in that experience because I was young and healthy. Like, I was super healthy. And I was always on top of my exercise. I was on top of my nutrition and I had big goals. Like I wanted to go into personal training and brand my own business and do promo modeling and fitness modeling. That's what my original route was. And also dabbling into medicine too, just, you know, to do all the things. And after I got hurt, I remember that night and it was, I was in so much pain after that slip and fall, like everything in my body. And it was just like screaming at me, like something's wrong. And fast forwarding the next few weeks, just from that injury was, um, I, I had major memory problems. I, I went from being fit and healthy and strong to barely being able to get out of bed, to barely being able to lift a tray. I was doing, I'm serving at the time, uh, restaurant serving to, to supplement my, um, uh, my income for school and university. And I could barely do that. I could barely walk. And there were so many things and it just, it got a little better and then it just kept getting worse. So fast forwarding that, um, it's kind of funny. It was um, a year after that initial fall. It was, uh, I remember testing out mattresses because I was getting a new bed and lying down and not being able to get up. It was literally, I think at that time too, it was the, the funny thing. Oh, I've fallen and I can't get up. But that was me. That was my life. Like I didn't have any strength and I had major pain just all the time. So that really impacted me because my identity at the time was wrapped up in my academic. Like I was top in my school academically. I was top in my school athletically. Um, so I was getting hit on kind of all those levels. Like I didn't have a memory anymore. I was pretty slow in, in my mental functioning. I, I lost my physical abilities. So that was kind of the start of my unwinding process. 
And then fast forwarding to 2015, I went to um, Germany for spinal surgery because it was degenerative disc disease. I had shrunk about almost a full inch in height just with the compression on, on that disc. And it was, it was a dead disc. Like if you look at my MRIs, it was like a pancake and it was black. <laughs> like it, it wasn't good. <laughs> so yeah, there was, there was so much in that and the way that it just affected everything. Um, and I, I told my doctors and everyone at the time, like, it feels like my head is shrinking into my body. And that's literally what it felt like. I'm just like, why is my head feeling so low? Like my neck is getting compressed. Um, so that was the explanation. So flying out there and having major surgery and their health facilities, they're just amazing out there. Like they have top notch facilities. It's really beautiful. And from there, like it was like a second lease on life. I went there because there was, um, it was the same um, doctors and company that did um, the spinal surgeries for the professional athletes and the same type of prosthesis that was put in. And, and I still wanted that in my life. I still wanted to, to be active, to play sports, to, to grow, to build business, to, to do, to do all of it. And that was, that was a chance for me. So that was 2015. I don't know if you want to interject at all. No, you know, this is already really good. I love how this is developing. I know that I didn't realize that you had that impact in, in universities. We did go to university together and I just want to add to, I know someone else that was like that and, and just how traumatic that is. And I, the f biggest thing that hit me was when I was experiencing mild concussions and I had one where I forgot my whole day and that was the worst concussion I ever had. And having that one time was so terrifying for my identity. And just when you start as a boxer, you're like, I'll take on anyone, you know, you just like, you want to think you'd be a champion of the world. Every really ambitious boxer starts that way. And then you finally realize you're human and just one shot can completely change your life. Mm -hmm. And I had many other like minor concussions compared to that one. But once you, can lose your memory, you realize you can lose your identity and how vulnerable you are. And so I can't imagine the frustration. I had a, a, a friend from work. Um, mm -hmm. She was in the kin program after us and she was, uh, she had dealt with a concussion that would give her constant headaches, constant every day. And when I knew her and I knew my mom had dealt with some head trauma from being kid. And it, it just made me realize like, maybe I don't need a box anymore. You know, it's like, why am I asking for this voluntary head trauma when it's some people are just battling it. So I'd love to hear how you keep going with this because this is huge. Like you're going through what should be your personal self-development in business and in life. And you're yeah. literally being crushed by it. So how did it move forward from here? Yeah. So I love that. And I love also the, um, your take on the experience of it right? Even if it was like just shorter term and, and just the light bulb moment too, of what am I actually doing to my body? Right. What are the actual goals? And it can be invigorating for, for boxing. Like I'd love to start kickboxing and all that, but with protective headgear and yes. away. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, but just, but love that experience that you got to have and, and that you really honor the people around you because there's an understanding now of whoa, like you're losing or like a little bit of brain damage or you're losing part of your identity. And that got me curious too, but what is my identity? So we can, we can hop into that later. Um, I'll, I'll continue the story, but um, yeah, around the time that was um, 2010 when I had that initial injury. And at that time too, because I still had pain, they gave me um, chronic or they had, yeah, gave me chronic pain, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia diagnosis as well onto, onto my chart. And I was, I was sure I'm just like, no, no, it's my nerves. There's something going on with my nerves. Um, but fast forward now to Germany. So after that, it was like a fresh lease on life. Like I switched out of the hospitality industry. I entered into, um, life insurance sales with a really beautiful company and I excelled right away. And it was like, I exercised, I was back in the gym, I could function, I could work. Like I learned, I excelled. I was right. I was top five in my company, North America, um, by month five of being with that company. 
And then by month six, all of a sudden things started going downhill again. And it was confusion and it was more pain and it was anxiety and it was crippling. It was so crippling. I had to go back or I had to go on disability and I tried to go back to work again because this was, it was so fulfilling for me to finally be able to do things. But noticing too in the pushing, because I was brought up with the mentality, with the uh, mentality of, um, no, you're okay. You just have to push through it. So I kept pushing and I kept trying to do things. And even I, that's when actually, um, me and Jace, my now husband, when we got together was during that time of when I was unable to work. And it's, it's curious to the, um, the gifts that come out of different life situations, because if I was still doing my job, I would have been 40 to 50 hours and then out of town on road trips, I wouldn't have had time for a relationship. Like it's, it's amazing how that happens too. And, but yeah, I got worse and worse and worse. And then we got married and then having, um, having our first child born in 2019 and during that pregnancy. And just before that as well, I got really bad and having moments of paralysis and not being able to move. And I had to give up just about everything. And we talk about in the, um, the, the chronic illness and the fibromyalgia community, kind of how many hours of energy or how many spoons of energy you have in a day or in a week. And I had maybe one to two hours of doing something other than resting or sitting or lying down. And I think that's the time too, um, when we were at the apartment together in right. 2019. And like, you got to see Jace every once in a while. And I'm pretty sure you get to, got to meet our son too, but I don't think we, like, we might've crossed paths maybe like one or two times. Yeah. Like in, in the <laughs> elevator, that's it. Yeah. 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 And, and it's funny cause even then, like, I'm sure, I'm not sure I could ask you too about what, what your thoughts were like, or if there were like, there probably wasn't any thought of, oh, she looks sick or right, anything no. like that. It's, well, she looks like probably not even a thought about it. Right. Right. Yeah. I didn't notice it at all. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because, um, it was such a struggle, like to get out of bed, but I always, um, I've always had this really beautiful optimism and kind of joy about life, even when like I can't walk or when I have my moments of extreme pain and, and I really, that's one thing that I find really important about the way that, um, that's carried me through this, that I don't get sucked into those moments. Um, because it was really shitty for a long time and, and it got worse and worse and worse over the years until in 2020, the end of 2020, um, I had a, a lump growing out of my stomach and I got misdiagnosed for ovarian cysts and I was pregnant at the time with my second. So we just left it in. It was during pandemic. So hospitals were over capacity. Like they weren't doing anything extra. And then coming to, um, after I gave birth beginning of 2021, uh, near the end of summer, I had a follow-up appointment. And by this time I was in consistent agony, like every day agony, like paralysis moments hit, and, and I needed help <laughs> so bad. And I actually, we had to move when we moved out of the apartment, we moved to Steinbach where my parents lived. Cause I needed them over every day to help because I couldn't even with my newborn child, I couldn't nurse her. I couldn't lift her or transfer or do diapers or watch my other children. I needed help pretty consistently. So I went into the doctor. I remember this visit very clearly. And she told me right at the beginning, just so you know, the hospitals aren't letting us do any surgeries unless it's really bad. So I just want to warn you about that. And she, about two minutes later, she said, I have to go make a phone call. And I was scheduled for surgery two days later. So it was big, it was bad. And I remember too going under the knife and coming out and I, I'm a bit of a, I'm a little cheeky. I'm a little bit of a jokester. And I look at the nurse next to me and I said, did you get it all? Cause I'm like, Oh my goodness, finally. And she said, no, honey, it's still in there. Whoa. 
and I was like, I was, I was being silly. Are you being silly? <laughs> so, no. So it turns out that the prosthesis that I had put in in 2015 was infected. Oh my God. So that's why it was got continually worse. It was an abscess that was growing from my psoas muscle, uh, from my spine. It was sticking out of my stomach. So it, it was very big. And it was bilateral, it was bilateral, so as abscess. So I had multiple pockets of infection in my body, the biggest being, I guess, about the size of my head. Wow. So extreme pain. And I was excited because there was finally an answer to it. Right. I was so relieved. Um, meanwhile, not knowing that this was really serious. Like, this should not have... I am um, my own case study in the world for this with this type of bacteria, type of infection, how big it was, um, all those things. And I remember getting so many visits from doctors. I had teams of doctors looking after me because there were a few complications with it that it grew so fast because we drained it, it grew again. So I had to be readmitted. And while we were waiting for surgery to take out my prosthesis, to do a fusion, to scrape out all the muscle that was infected and beyond repair and and to wash out. And then it was four months of, um, I had a pick line in for daily IV uh, antibiotic treatments. So wow. it, was, it was loaded. It was, and during that whole time, I was so excited because something was happening. And day by day, like every day I noticed there was a difference in my pain levels, in my abilities, in being able to do stuff, finally. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting too, because there were so many things that went wrong. Right. <laughs> um, like being in the hospital, um, like really, again, during pandemic time, not a good time to be in the hospital, right? Like wow. it was a very lonely place. Like visitors were were limited. I was um, six months postpartum at that time um, with, from my second child being born. And part of it was relaxing. And then the other part was um, I had a bed malfunction on me the two days after I, I had major surgery done. So I was, I was in pain, like so much pain. And my, my bed kept rising oh, it, my God. and then we unplugged it and it kept rising. And I'm like, I need a new bed. Like this is beyond excruciating pain. And, and so trans like all these things and, and, um, yeah, having to get, um, we had, uh, an artery nicked during surgery too. So having all the blood transfusions, like I had three bags of blood and I just, I look at people now, my husband, he always gives blood and donates blood. And I look at them with so much respect because that saved my life too. Mm -hmm. There were so many moments like that, that it was like, oh, like that went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong. But in the end, there's also so much healing that happened because what was preventing me, like my bodies are healing machines. They're absolutely amazing. But there was something that was preventing me from healing, which we got out. And it was amazing. That's such an incredible adventure, especially because you're coming from a place where you almost had some answers. You go to Germany and then you get that little spark of reassurance and then it goes backwards. And that, that, how long was that time period from when you went, uh, you went to Germany it was six months later and then you said it started getting worse. How mm -hmm. long before they realized that the Germany surgery was, did not go well? 2021, the end of 2021. So that would have been, was that like, uh, how many years is that? Oh my goodness. Math, uh, over front it, so 2015, so it was about middle of 2016 when things started getting bad again. Yeah. And then it was the fall of 2021 when we actually found out and did the surgery. So five years. Wow. Yeah, five yeah. years. And so I'm curious about why did they send you to Germany in the first place? I'm really curious about that. They didn't send me. Okay. I was, I was in pain and I was looking for other options because the right. way that system works i was otherwise young and healthy which means i wasn't eligible to have my spine done or to be looked at in other ways and at the time too i 
like there was just no reason for my body to get worse and worse and worse. I see. And, yeah. and they weren't giving you many answers here. So you looked no. for that surgery as an option. Yeah. I look for other specialists and I look for like, what can I do to help myself? Because when, when we look at our healthcare system here, it's not a, we want you to have the best quality of life. It's no, no, we're going to keep you from dying. Yeah. So it's very, it's very different, right? It's a very, our, and I, I've been on other, um, podcast too, when we talk about the medical system and kind of the pros and cons and the purpose and, and along those lines. And, and it's a really interesting topic. And especially, I think the pandemic brought up a lot more of those, those question marks about, well, what is the medical system in the hospitals for and, and what is health and how can we advocate for, for health? and for better quality of life and for even preventative measures too. And that's why I love the work that you do really with health and nutrition and exercise, because that'll help people stay out of the system because you don't want to be in that system like at all. No. And and like you say, it is totally to keep people alive. Um, You know, it's very heavily medicated and, I mean, there's, you say there's pros and cons, right? We're, we're in Canada, so we have a free healthcare system. And even in the States, they're going to have a very similar thing of like, let's get this person not in pain. The fairness I have on the doctors when they're dealing with, you know, foreign inspection people, or it's like, they got to go on statins, they got to, you know, control blood pressure, all these things. Like they already know, they, they tell these people to diet and exercise. They're not trained in it. And so they can't give really good knowledge but yeah. they tell those people to do it, but they're going to try to keep them alive because that's actually what they have to do. And then on the other end is there's still like this lack of willingness to give optimal advice. Like I went to my doctor and I said, Hey, I want to check my testosterone. I want to, and it's like, not because I'm trying to do steroids. I just want to know, am I in the healthy range of this vitamin, that vitamin? I just want to be optimal. It's like, uh, unless we have any problems, we can't actually check that. So yeah. if you want to do it, you have to pay out of pocket and you go to somewhere else. And it's like, I kind of get that because it is a free healthcare system, mm-hmm. but you would even mention like you're talking about, we could prevent these things if we were willing to invest in it. And I mean, when you look at even, you know, our health insurance here in Canada and in most places, it doesn't cover a personal trainer very often or not often enough. And that is a frontline person. That is someone right on the front lines. No one can have the best preventative measure than either a nutrition or a trainer or both because they give you the day-to-day tools, right? Uh, But just come back to your story because I think this is really interesting how, they couldn't solve the problem for you at all. And what was the story that they were giving you when you came back from Germany as far as like why it's still precipitating? Mm, well, it, it fell back on fibromyalgia, chronic pain, uh, chronic fatigue, and also being in the, and it also fell back on too, while well, you're pregnant, you have pregnancy hormones or your postpartum. So it's really interesting too, when you look at um, female physiology, especially in the medical field, it's, it's new for studying all the medical research that we have is based on the male physiology, the male body and how that works, right? That's just the way, that's just the fact of the way it is. So really looking at female biology, it's new. So, and hormones are vastly different in the way that we we have our 28 day cycle versus a man's 24 hour cycle in the way that we are uh, our bodies cycle hormones in the way that we need rest the way that our progesterone progesterone and estrogen in the way that they cycle and even the way that we respond to cortisol it's vastly different from male biology so it's interesting too that i find and and not a surprise but interesting and i love that more of um more research is heading in this direction of, of looking at females and, and the differences, because there's also the statistic there in the research showing that um, 80% of females will be diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder. Wow. Yeah. And this isn't surprising knowing that autoimmunity is based on hormones and the way that your body relates in that way. And also given pregnancy and what the body goes through there um, and the extreme situations of the internal 
kind of system. Um, but it, it is an area for study. Like there's so many different fascinations and curiosities in that. And knowing too, the way that I've studied too, and um, I, I also was recently diagnosed with an autoimmune condition. Uh, so we can touch on that too, because there's more to the story. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, um, it was lots of we don't know but covered in blanket diagnoses of fibro or chronic fatigue or chronic illness, which doesn't mean anything. It's pretty much just saying we don't know and we're not willing to look further. Wow. That's, that's oh. so sad that they just say that we're not willing to look farther. Yeah. Were they just providing you with an, any pain management, any other things to kind of look at or to help you work through life? Well, that, that's interesting. I saw so many specialists as well. I saw rheumatologists and um, neurologists and lots of ologists in there. And I remember too, even my uh, my surgery team, which was, uh, they were absolutely amazing in in what they did for my body, but new symptoms coming up and me bringing it to their attention. Like even like half my face went numb and my blood pressure dropped and this was the like within 24 hours after my my major surgery and pardon me uh, me bringing it to to the team to the question and they were saying well that's not our department and i mean you just ripped me open and did a nine hour surgery on me and then my face went numb and my blood pressure dropped yes this is your department so get that being on the list again and i'm still on a wait list I've been on a wait list now for seven or eight months to see a different neurologist to get a second opinion or, or look into it. So it's, um, it's a frustrating system for sure. And, and also though, giving the realization too, that it's not a system for health, right? right? Not a system for health. It's to prevent people from, from dying. It's to, to do the surgeries, right? It's to, to do that. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Zach Bush, um, mm -hmm. more of the functional doctors. And in their, their research and their expertise, they were saying, don't quote me for sure on the number because it's either 70 or 80%. Um, but they were saying that 70 to 80% of people who go to hospitals who see doctors now, they don't need to. They just need to do things differently with their nutrition and with their exercise and also with their inner work. Right. Because this is where it comes in with the stress levels, right? With the internal dialogue, with how we are to ourselves and how we treat ourselves, which adds to this dis-ease, right? Feelings of disease. And that's chronically where a lot of things stem from. I think that's a very fair number when it comes to most of the issues when it comes to health are due to poor poor diet like are due to being overweight you know uh you're looking at ridiculous numbers coming out of the states where it's like 60 to 70 percent you're talking about the majority of the united states is obese or overweight mm -hmm. and the obese number is driving up fast mm -hmm. and we're right behind them in canada so you already got this energy toxicity state a lot of people are in mm -hmm. and the food industry is just too easy for people to walk away from and what you mentioned about inner work is so important because you know people really hate on diet culture and it's just like diet culture is just problems like well here's the thing is we haven't figured out a way to change your behaviors and it's now a psychological issue because anyone can google exactly what to eat to lose weight no one wants to do it and so now you're talking about the, the major problem isn't what you're physically doing, what you're physically eating. It's how you feel about those things routinely throughout the day and how you can make that a part of your life routinely. And there's a reason why when it comes down to like, you know, long-term weight gain, 95% of people gain it back because they don't enjoy the lifestyle. Yeah. So when you look at these uh, overarching things and problems, it's it, it makes sense that you mentioned this healthcare quote unquote system is a, you know, preventative de disease system. Mm -hmm. And it's hearing your story is so interesting because it's, it is so unique that you have all these problems, you're all these doctors, 
my girl recently got me watching Dr. House again. So this TV show <laughs> where he like solves all the problems. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a part of it is like almost overwhelming and terrifying because if you're hypochondriac, you shouldn't fucking watch that show <laughs> because <Nope. laughs> the, the amount of things that go wrong and you got these four genius doctors bouncing ideas, bounce ideas, test this, test that, something else goes wrong. No, it's obviously written in a certain way, but I don't deny that these are close to reality in terms of like, you're, you're a case, you're a house study. Like, what's the problem? What's having this reaction? You're going to this specialist, this specialist. And the body is so complex that you have to specialize. But then because you have individual specialization, you won't have holistic treatment. You won't have, you know, discussion between groups. And this is even a problem within different trades, right? If a doctor were to talk to me about, you know, overall health, if he's a trainer, nutrition coach, it's like, I'm a doctor. It's like, yeah. And I studied the food and the impacts that it has and the training that it has. And so it's like, you know, your specialty, I know mine, but they bleed into each other a fair bit. And so I just think that's so interesting. I'd love to hear how this continues because you've continued to evolve. And when you're, uh, you're, you're so now optimistic about actually before getting the optimism, how did you manage optimism during the dark days where you had no answer? What was, what was your mindset keeping you moving forward? Especially, you know, you just had kids, like what was the thing that you were really holding on to? Well, I think, um, thank you for that question, because this is really powerful, that it all stems from from presence, is being in the moment. It's not creating stories of what should be, right? It's it's what's here right now. Because I, I study the work of Byron Katie, I use it in my practice a lot and with my clients, and it's pain is temporary, but suffering is in your mind. Right. So what are the stories that you're believing that are creating the suffering, right? And it's the same too when we're going towards goals, when we're when we're goal setting, when it's like, well, when I achieve this, I'm going to be happy, right? Or then I'll have made it, or then I will have arrived. And it's not necessarily the goal, like goals are great, but it's your attachment to the goal and what you think it'll give you. Versus you already thinking I, or really realizing that I do have that. So I think that was the biggest thing for me. It was, I didn't create stories that I should be any different. And even in the moments of extreme pain where I, where I couldn't move, where I was like on the ground. And I, I remember one specific one too, I could feel kind of these attacks coming on. And luckily at this time, I did not have a baby yet. So, it's, so this was before that. But I remember feeling it going on and I always had my phone on me in case I needed help. So I always had to have it on me. And I was reaching, I was stepping towards my medication bottle because I was like, they get really bad and it helps. And I couldn't make it. I was mid stride and I was just going down and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and just being on the ground alone and then finally calling my husband um, he was at work and I said, I can't move. I can't do anything. Can you come home? And in those moments of just being so extreme, just feeling the pain just for exactly what it is. And I am, I'm very attuned somatically to my body. And when I was, it was so fun when I was, um, probably junior high, high school. I don't know if you've heard of the, um, the Robert Jordan wheel of time series, but it was a huge long series and I loved reading. Like I read them over and over again. Like they were, I think it turned out to be like 12 books of like 800 to a thousand page books, like really beautiful. And in these, these books, this, they were fantasy books, but there was this specific group of people who were like the warriors and they were out in the wild. And one thing that always got me about them is that they always embraced pain. And that stuck with me. And I'm so glad that, that I had that background for it because it wasn't about resisting pain or denying it or saying it shouldn't be here. It was just, it's here. And it's complete acceptance of the moment, right? And then there's no fighting. There's no nothing. It's just, we'll relax into what's here. And that made it a lot easier. 
it's very powerful. It's beautiful wisdom too, that, you know, people need to hear and appreciate because you have a story so unique. Very few people would ever go through so much pain and suffering for so many years. And then for you to come within the moment of having that experience, you're like, it's here. This is what it is. One of my favorite mantras is Amore Fate. And this comes from, uh, I actually heard about it through Ryan Holiday, who studies a lot of the Stoic philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. And Amore Fate is about the love of fate and mm -hmm. to just embrace whatever life is giving you. And listening to that whole rundown that Ryan Holiday gave of it really made me appreciate that is the most important thing is whatever you have to see that as being that's the moment it is and how you can make it great for yourself. It is truly finding the opportunity in every tragedy and because you can't change it and, you, and you, you can look at it as a fortune to your story. You look at it as the thing that's going to really make you you once you scar you're going to get stronger that is the old adage and i think it's amazing that you've been through something so severe and then for you to have that appreciation and kind of calmness because a lot of people haven't come even close to experiencing anything like mm -hmm. that as far as pain and so you don't even develop the idea of resiliency you don't mm -hmm. know what resiliency really is and so more things can push you down and you become more vulnerable to your environment. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, you know, how you're, you're in these moments, you're, you're pushing through, uh, and now you finally get this, this answer, you're, you're coming out of it. How was the evolution out of finding out that this was, uh, this was the concern? Mm. It was, it was mind blowing. Like I said, it was such a relief to, to know what was going on in my body. Cause like I had been trying to fight for my body. And that's one thing too, with, with learning how to trust your inner voice. Right. And that's a big part of the work that I do as well is learning how to trust yourself and speak for yourself. Cause we all have a voice. It's just learning how again, right. Uncovering the layers of why am I speaking for myself or what's stopping me. And I love too, what you brought up before, um, about um, health and kind of the stature that doctors have and kind of there's there's a separation in that about, well, I'm the doctor, I know better, or I'm the trainer and I do this and really health is holistic. And I think that's a really powerful point. I just want to emphasize that because even so in um, just acknowledging gut health, it's not just like the area below your stomach or your stomach, right? No, like your skin plays a part in gut health, your sinuses, the way that it, that it echoes, the way that your microorganisms are throughout your body, like mouth all the way and out the bottom. It's not just your gut, so to say. So I love that you bring that up and how when you look at someone, it's not just sectioned off. Like it's, it's a holistic, a human, like a whole being. So I love that you brought that point. I, I just wanted to really emphasize that because it's so beautiful, so important. And yeah, coming out of my story, like um, it was excruciating coming out of the major surgery. I had drainage tubes. I had all these different things and surprises with bed smell functioning and different things that just kind of happen, right? Like I, it was, um, it was a nine hour surgery. Um, and for me, what they did, they had to go in through the stomach. I have pretty massive scars on my stomach where they had to do kind of the front part of my spine. And then they had to turn me over and cut open my back, uh, and do the back part of my spine. So it was like a pancake, I guess, scenario, flippy flop. Um, so yeah, I had scars in my front, in my side, in my back with staples everywhere and <laughs> like muscle chunks taken out and my spine redone. And, and that, that was intense. And the healing from that was, um, excruciating to put it kindly <laughs> or nicely. It was, that was the most pain I've ever been in is healing from that surgery and finally getting all the tubes out and stuff after a little while. And 
then I, I got transferred back to um, the local hospital, Steinbach. This was help, happening at um, Health Sciences, where the major surgery was. And then coming back to my local hospital after, after things had kind of settled down. And then the growth started growing again. I saw it sticking out of my stomach again. So big surprise. And I had to be transferred back to Health Sciences. And it took two, two to three. I don't remember exactly two to three days till I could get in for imaging again, um, waiting there. And my ID doctor, my infectious disease doctor came in to give me the news of the results. And he said, we don't know what's happening, but it's going down. So you can go home now. Wild. Hey, wild. He said, take it for miracle. Thank whatever you believe in, whatever higher power, because it's going down and we have no explanation. Wow. So, yes. Well, it's yeah. about time you got a break, to be fair, right? <laughs> yeah, so absolutely amazing. Um, coming back to my home, my kids were living with my parents because my husband still had to work. And also I couldn't have kids jumping on me. So it was a really tough time being separated. I think we did that for about 10 days after I got home just to be able to give me a break. Cause I still, I needed help all the time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get myself out of bed. Like I, I was so weak and so in pain still. And my exercises were very minimal. It was walking with high knees around my kitchen um, Island two or three times a day. That was the extent of my exercise. Mm -hmm. So going from that and then it was two months later that I went to go see my doctors in person again because we were doing phone phone call appointments. And then my doctors, when I'm walking out, because they don't see you walk in, right? You're already in the room. But walking out, I just I get up and I walk out. And my doctor stops. He says, Whoa, look at you walking. I was like, oh, was I not supposed to be? <laughs> no, you weren't. Like they were thinking. Paralysis was likely because it was so much work so close to my spine. And best case scenario is extreme back pain for the rest of your life. Wow. And you don't I, have any of the back have, pain? I don't have pain. Wow. I don't have pain. I'm fully functional. I can lift all three of my kids at the same time now. Like it's <laughs> It's unbelievable. It really is. And there was some major points though. Um, two major point, I think two major points that I really want to touch on. And um, I really had to question myself because I had started working out in the next few months doing my at home, like exercise videos. Like I was doing squats. I was doing lunges. I was starting to add weight. Like this is more than I've been able to do with for my, or with my body since 2010. So it had been 11 years since I could move my body in this type of way and, and do exercises and even exert myself. Like I was sweating because I was exercising. That doesn't happen or didn't happen for so long because I couldn't get that far. So really amazing. But then I started plateauing and then pain started creeping up again. And, but it was like pain in my legs and other things going on. And I was like, what's going on? And this is when I started doing, um, different self-development courses and different coaching courses and trying to really create more of a full range. Cause I wanted to get into building my business and different leadership opportunities. And, and I remember sitting down one night and actually really deeply reflecting, do I actually want to get better? Because this was scary. And that's what I think when we come upon, when we're plateauing, in my experience, when, we're, when we just have to push so hard and not seeing results, not seeing things that, are, that we're working towards come to fruition, it's because there's an unconscious or a subconscious fear. And that's what I work with with, with my clients. It's 95% of our behavior, the way that we do life is in the subconscious and unconscious realm. We only live out our, our day with 5% conscious awareness unless we are actively doing the work to uncover what's, what's driving our behavior. So I really had to ask myself, do I actually want to get better? And really look at it just honestly. And it was, it was really scary to think about getting better 
like I hadn't had a job in six years. I haven't been able to be alone with my kids. Like I haven't been able to even keep a house or go out and socialize. And those things were scary. So I really had to, to let those fears come up and really examine them and, and really bring it into consciousness that, yes, it was scary with the way that I was before because I couldn't do anything. I wasn't physically capable. I wasn't mentally capable to handle going out or being out or, or chasing my kids or like if one ran away from me or if I needed to pick them up, like there was a lot of fear around all of that. So really allowing myself to make the decision, yes, I want to get better and it's going to be okay because I'll develop my range as I grow physically and mentally. And I get back to a new state, a new elevated state because what happened in the past doesn't have to happen again in the future. That's such an important question. I think so many people underestimate the power of the subconscious mind and just these, you nailed it from the start. It's like, what's the story you're telling yourself when you're in pain, but even when you're afraid to do something and you're not aware that you're afraid of it, you're not aware of what is this internal resistance. You can feel this physically in you. You can feel things and there's a lot of manifestation of pain in people. People can get back problems. Sometimes it, it manifests itself into even like what looks like diseases. Like it's amazing the power of mind in terms of how it can actually self-sabotage. And so many people are unaware. It's just like a way that we manifest the problems. And if you can just, oh, but this is this issue, I can't do it. And it's like, is it the fear of that? Is it the fear that if that's not actually an issue, you got to do the work all the time. You got to actually confront this every single day. But I think on the other side of it that people are unaware of when they do have to say, Hey, I, you, this is the work you would have to do. And you're physically capable of it is that they don't realize that you become more at ease with the work, right? You, the people need to accept it's like, yes, it's going to be challenging, but that's actually the great part is you even mentioned about being in the present moment of pain, being in the present moment of a challenge. It's like, that's actually the great part about it. So what was that light bulb moment like and how did you really help yourself through that kind of an emotional state? Yeah, no, that was, that was life changing. And that was, that was also such great awareness because I got to let go of so much that I was holding on to so much of the fears and so much of what was keeping me stuck. And, and since then too, I've um, really gone into somatic experiencing and embodiment work and emotional intelligence and really moving energy around in your body to to create more releases to create more health more homeostasis in the system from what we've been locking up so yeah moving forward from that it was it's so funny because <laughs> i um i ended up in the er <laughs> with all these wild symptoms i was having it turns out i was pregnant <laughs> So after major surgery, <laughs> this was six months after that major surgery, I found out I was pregnant for with my third child. So again, so much fear coming up and just, oh my goodness, like, can my body handle another big thing, right? Like it was, it was mind blowing. And then really coming, coming back internally and again, and just realizing and witnessing my body is how powerful it is. And there was research that I read when I had my first that when a woman is pregnant and she's growing this baby in her, there's cells from the baby that are nourishing the mother and healing the mother at the same time. It's this really beautiful healing system. So that's what I kind of fell back on. I'm like, okay, I'm pregnant because my baby's going to help me heal. And it was really powerful and really nourishing and do not recommend getting pregnant after you've got so much scar tissue <laughs> in your abdomen and in your back. Cause that, that wasn't fun. The way that it scar tissue doesn't stretch very well. Like it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't fun. It was really uncomfortable, but, but at the same time, really just extraordinary, like what the body can do 
And it's still like, it still amazes me the whole process of pregnancy and healing and, and everything. Um, so that's the year two that I went through. Um, I wanted to really elevate because I was starting my business before that coming out of surgery. Of course you want to start a business, right? That's <laughs> my mindset. <laughs> yeah. And, and really thinking that I have all these, these really powerful ahas and insights and systems, but I wanted something to go deeper transformatively wise and support people on a larger level. So that's the year two that I invested in a year long certification coaching program, which really focused on doing your own transformation as well, right? Cause how can you help others if you haven't seen the way? Right. So really leading to just a wealth of just release in myself and really seeing where am I? And it always comes to where am I holding myself back? Right. Like when you talk to clients, it's like, well, what's your biggest challenge right now? Or what's getting in your way? And the answer is usually, well, it's me. I'm getting in my own way. It's like, okay, let's explore. Right. Like, first of all, forgiving any judgments, right. Cause it's not bad or anything. We're just exploring. And one thing about my practice too, and the methodology that I've learned is if you judge it or you identify with it, you're stuck. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So really coming to this place of um, really acceptance, just kind of what I was speaking to before, right? The pain, it's here. That's it, right? There's no stories. It's, it's here. We're welcoming it because it's it's serving us in some way. We might not know how or why, but all parts are here to serve. And I think that's really powerful because once you see whatever is coming up with a compassionate lens, then you can change it. Then it can transform. Then it can move through if we're talking about energy or it can release. And then it's a different playing. Then it's a different game. Very powerful mindset. And something I really love to hit on is that identity piece that people have a problem with. And that's what's going to lend itself to playing a victim or to playing the role you keep playing. Mm -hmm. Every time I listen to a client, I always like, that's an important red flight word. When mm -hmm. someone says, you know, I, I just had to, or I just didn't have any time. There's absolutely nothing I could do. And I, I got this from Jason Brooks and it's a red flag statement. And mm -hmm. when you hear people talk in absolutes or identifying uh, framework. This is where they're just literally supporting their subconscious level of thinking with the problem behavior. I was talking to a client just recently and he was struggling with, you know, he would eat very well during the week and mm -hmm. then it would be at a social occasion. And then he was like feeling guilty about it. I was like, I just had to have another. And he's like, well, okay. It's okay that you had another, but do we need to have to say that you just had to, because now you've just told your body that you had to. And that's actually, and you're like, oh, I was just joking. You're like, no, that's a very literal thing for your subconscious mind. And when you, you use any language towards, ah, you know, I guess I'm just being a chubby guy or, I, you know, I'm just, you know, I, I just have to overeat or anything you, you feel like is such an I am statement, even in a joking matter, is going to just continue to reinforce the behavior that you're trying to fight. And it's totally different if you use a framework of, just this is the action I took because it yeah. gives you an opportunity for change. It's like, yeah. you know, I, I didn't need another one, but uh, an, an extra potato, but I did. It's like, I yeah. didn't, but I did. It's just like, it's very different. There's like, I just had to, because you can identify the problem and not attach yourself to the action. Mm -hmm. I'm really big on when people try to say they have absolutely no time. It's like, I, there's nothing I could do. I had no time. It's like, okay. That framework is never going to help you. It's okay if you said you had way more other, way more important things. It's okay if you said you had so many other things to prioritize. But what I even prefer to say when I didn't do something, I don't say I didn't have the time. It's like, or I don't even say I didn't find the time. I say I didn't make the time. Mm -hmm. Because if you say I didn't make the time, then next time you can look at your schedule, whatever you're doing, this gives you the opportunity for responsibility. It's like, hey, how can I make the time? So I just love hitting that identity piece and the, the, the power of words that you talk about going into the subconscious thinking and, and unconscious mind. It's like, it's so important because 
This is why psychology has such a hard time understanding people. It's this complete soft skill of understanding this very complex being because as complicated as we already discovered your physiology is and all the problems you have, it is vastly more complicated on a grand scale for what we understand about psychology and emotions when we're actually coming to trying to create long-term behavior change. I just want to hit on that. And I think that's incredible that you came on your own evolution for that. So this is what inspired you to want to help others and to want to, you know, start your own business to have their own transformation. Is that kind of how this evolved? Yeah. Yeah. And there was one thing um, or a few things too, that led up to it that, these big aha moments that I don't want anyone to have to go through what I went through. And I think there's so much purity out there of, of people who have that. They're just like, well, I had something really bad happen to me. What did I learn that I can share so that others don't have to fall like that. They can use it as a stepping stone and go higher. So that was, yeah, one of the main things there. And I want to just echo to what you were saying about um, words having so much power. And really, we can, we can be the victim or we can be the hero of our own stories, right? Victim language is very different than hero language. And coming to the choice of when I'm, I'm with my clients, it's no, I'm choosing to do something. But then also when you're making those statements is what are the judgments that are coming up? Oh, what I did was bad. And then we're going in a shame loop or a shame cycle because then we're stuck with it still, right? We can still take responsibility, but then what is our inner world like? Are we beating ourselves up? Are we, because that keeps us stuck in it. And then we're more likely to do it again versus I ate it. I was hungry, move forward, right? Like it's, it's different, right? It's like one has all this emotional tension and, and we're so caught up in it. And then we shame ourselves and then it goes on forever because what happens too is on a deeper level too, that's comfortable, if we're looking at even um, from a relationship standpoint too, when we're in different situations where it's comfortable, even if they're not un- if they're not healthy relationships, we our nervous system sees them as comfortable, sees them as safe because it's what we're used to. So even making a healthier choice seems more risky, can put our nervous system at at more of a. a di- uh, uneasy state because it's new. So also being able to recognize that as well is why am I doing these behaviors, right? Is it out of fear? Is it out of inspiration? Am I looping in something? Am I shaming myself after? Cause there's something about taking ownership and moving forward versus being stuck in the moment. So I wanted to highlight there cause I, I felt you were going there and mm-hmm. just how much more pow- how powerful it is to just be the hero, right? And just take responsibility. I chose to do this. Right. It's that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, and the way that you talk about compassion is so important. Like you chose it and that's okay. And I I also tell people like guilt isn't going to be something that just disappears. It's Mm -hmm. guilt resistance, not, you know, you know, completely guilt free because guilt's going to show you some sort of a, a signal to your body's like, Hey, you did something that didn't sit in line with your value. You took an action that you, you actually don't like the result of in some way towards your values. So it's like, Oh, I had this food, the amount I had, whatever, I feel guilty. Okay, that's fine. But do you stay in that guilt? Ignore the lesson that was there. He's like, you ate all that food. It's like, okay, but there's a lesson there. What, What was the moment that put you into guilt? Maybe it was like the third, fourth, fifth bite. I don't know. But if you just like, I just hate that moment. I hate who I am. Well, mm-hmm. all this hate, all this negative language just manifests with that feeling of guilt and staying in it versus, okay, guilt was a signal. Pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. What was the action that you took? Okay. And I always tell people like, see it just like a, an athlete looks at reviewing the tape. Go back mm-hmm. to that moment. Ask yourself where the action was. What was the piece of food that went too far? What were your emotions in that moment? What led led you to make that decision? And maybe have an an awareness next time you're in that position, because it's not if, it's when it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And you highlighted something very major there is that our nervous system, our subconscious level of thinking is going to get very uncomfortable doing something new in that state. 
and it only makes sense. It's no different than if you, I always like to use like the physical experience because it, it makes sense for people that if you didn't know how to skate and I put you on ice, your body's going to be shaking on ice, right? But if you put enough reps in on the ice, I've seen this with my girl, like she barely knew how to skate and we just went like once a year and she's like, Hey, you can skate without holding on to me. And that is just, it went from her nervous system being very shaky to smoother and smoother. And that's how it goes when you're, you know, doing new behaviors, but it's even more important that important that you reinforce it with the proper emotional state as well. So you can be comfortable with it. So I'm curious how you help, you know, people in business using these types of skills. Mm, that's such a good question. I love that. I'm just looking at the time. Yeah, yeah. Let's dive into <laughs> I this. I feel like in, we in could this... go on and on and on because yeah. this is really fun. So in business too, like when you're coming up against something, whether it's uh, fear of failure, whether it's imposter syndrome, whether it's doing something new or growing or fear of being seen, there's something important in there that wants to be seen or heard, right? So Neuroscience says it takes 90 seconds for an emotion to pass through the body energetically. But when we get stuck in it, that's when we loop, right? That's when we're in our mind about it and we loop into story. We really have that emotion as a set point. So now we're operating from that set point of stuck energy. So I have a client right now who um, he's very um, successful in his business. He's in the real estate game and he's been working with me. He wants, he wanted more spaciousness. He wanted to let go of his business to delegate help. He wants to grow it at the same time. And he wants his relationships with his wife, with his kids to be more meaningful. So what are we doing? We are, we're looking at this attachment to self-worth how it's tied to his business because there's a misconception in our community a really deep belief system that we are our job and that's our worth so really then when we try to step away from the skills or the service that we provide that's a scary thought because we tie up our worth in that so i do a lot of worth work um with my clients and then also as we're stepping into being for him, it was, how do I shift? Because he, he, he has actually lots of health goals too. So shifting in that too, what we were talking about, getting caught up in the shame loop cycle about, well, when I go to not do something productive, and I think there's something in that too, not being able to rest. I can't turn it off. I can't stop. What do I do? So really seeing the stories that are being said, like what is guilt trying to tell you? And then allowing it to move through versus staying stuck there. So we go to the same cycle because then it's not just, okay, I'm having a bag of chips because that bag of chips lasts for the next 24 hours yeah. for what we're saying internally. And, and like the spinoffs of that, well, then I'm going to go watch TV and then I'm going to beat myself up over that. So really coming down to allowing things to move through, accepting the present moment trusting in what your body has to tell you. And then it's just a bag of chips, right? <laughs> and even the step before it's okay. Am I eating this bag of chips because I actually want to, or was I trying to avoid feeling something else? Absolutely. There's, there's such a belief in, in our community, in our society too, about um, emotional intelligence. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. Cause that's a, a really, um, powerful, powerful topic. And we think that feeling a feeling is hard, but what's actually hard is avoiding feeling the feeling. Right. I actually, I love that you hit that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that has been a huge mindset shift for myself was how much, cause we're in a distracted world, right? Dopamine nation. Yeah. And it's so easy to not have to think for yourself. Anytime it's calm, it's like, where's your phone, podcast, music, anything. And then I started to realize, like, I don't spend time thinking just to myself, to my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I did this a lot last year. And even to this day, I, I won't allow myself at certain times to be distracted because there's so much to process. Mm -hmm. And just think about, obviously, you can go back even 30 years, but you go back 100 years where there wasn't even radios. Mm -hmm. People spent a lot of time thinking. They actually did. 
and they were okay with it. Your your internal dialogue is a wonderful playground, but we are terrified of it. I remember when I started telling people that I drive without a radio, no music, no podcast. I was like, people will call me a psychopath. And it's like, it's actually super calming. It's yeah. like one of the most calming things is the sound of just a highway in a car. It's just like white noise to me. So I love that you really highlight that. And I think that's so important for people to know. And I do know you're tight on time before your kids get home. So what I want to finish off with this podcast, definitely having you on again, because we're just getting into the business stuff. You warned me, you said you got a long story and it's a great one. So we're going to come back on, dive more into the business stuff. But what I got to know is what's your most recent ambition? What are you really excited with coming down the pipeline? Oh, this is so good. I'm going to stick with, with business because recently, like I'm, I'm growing my business and I'm adding on some new things. I'm adding on more of a, I, lo- I love to do one-to-one in-depth dive, in-depth dives with, with different businesses, different, um, people when they're either working on growing a business, their startup, or they're working on expanding like their next level or even stepping away while still growing. I mean, those are all different, beautiful stages, but what I'm newly working on right now and, and offering and starting taking bookings for is workshops and retreats within the business realm. So really, how are we looking at And it's all stemming on personal responsibility, right? Whether that's in effective communication, having hard conversations, mindfulness, increasing productivity, uh, increasing joy and contentment, and really being present. Because I think there's something to say about, um, you've probably read these books too, but um, Tim Ferriss, like four, four or five hour work week, like all these different ways about how to increase your productivity and the methods that I use too, when it comes down to um, just different, uh, ha- well, call them hacks or whatever, but but how to really access different brain states and how to be more protective and how to get into flow state and really maximize what you want to do, how you want to work, elevate your your team and really flow towards your goals with more efficiency and more spaciousness. So there's more connection and it's fun, right? And it's playful and we're still excelling. And yeah, so that's, I don't know if that, yeah, I think that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that you're hitting on the flow state stuff because mm-hmm. my best friend does uh, his PhD studies in that. He's uh studying this really brand new field because some people don't even know what flow state is and just having that to be able to use it as a skill is not only just going to make you way better at your job to be in the state of just being immersed in your task but it's just so much more meaningful in life and I, I think about that all the time it's like what can i do to set up my day and my job what is the task that I'm just going to flow and I don't look at the the clock. That's the key to finding some really good, meaningful work in your life. And and I think that's beautiful. Well, I, this has been so great to have you on Alyssa. Again, you, you, you assured me and you're quite correct. You got a lot to, to discuss here. So we're going to have you on again, but why don't you tell the listeners where they can find more about your stuff? Mm, yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to work on this eventually too. My business is completely offline. I'm starting to get my, my Instagram page going with testimonials, how you can reach me, all that. So that's at Van Alstein, Alyssa. And also I'd love to offer too my, my Calendly link for if this really touched someone, if they're going on there, if they want to achieve goals in business, in, in whatever it is, and they're curious. I, I'd love to really honor your your audience and and give them that opportunity as well. So I'll drop that with you, and you can put it where it needs to be. But yeah, otherwise Instagram, or if you see me on the street. Awesome. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'll put all that stuff in the show notes, and they'll have that info. So thank you again so much, Alyssa. We'll have you on again soon. So great. Thank you, Ryland. Such an honor. Thanks again to Alyssa. That is an incredible story. I still sit here very, very blown away as to the severity of what she was going through. And I had no idea. I knew it was difficult, but I didn't know it was that she would get maybe a handful of hours throughout a week that she could actually function throughout her life and how she was able to take that mindset of handling pain. Pain was just there. She didn't identify with it. She took it as just being what it is and just being in that state. 
but not to internalize it in a suffering mindset. That is so powerful. Not many people could do that. And I hope this kind of gives you a good lens as to how to manage pain and frustration in your own life. Pain is just there. You don't have to identify it. And to be the hero of your own story is so important not to play the victim. How could it serve her when she's going through all these difficulties? You know, you got to look at how the healthcare industry really didn't help her very much at all, but it was just unable to. Those were her circumstances. So she looked for other help. She got what seemed like a better solution, and that didn't serve her. And she spent years suffering with that pain. And then when she finally was able to find an answer, she had a great deal of gratitude, even though it was terrifying. She was just happy to have an answer. And that goes to show you the power of gratitude in that very moment. Then to have more pain and to realize that it was a child on the way and to have that terrifying feeling of another child. But what did she do? She then had this idea of this this child's going to heal me. And again, it's this positive spin. It's this ability to feel grateful for what is there, what could be there for her in that moment. Not focusing on the negative, not focusing on what could make her the victim. Again, to feel empowered by her circumstances. And we talked off air as soon as we finished about how some people were saying, well, you could sue them. Like you should sue them. You shouldn't have to go through with this. This is ridiculous. And it's a very good point. A lot of people would think, you know, the, the, the people who did the surgery to you, they made a terrible error that you were suffering for years. But her sentiment was they did their best. And I'm better now. Now I know what it is. What would it serve me to stay in that? You got to think about it. You'd have to literally relive that. She would have to go through cases. She would have to, you know, legal fees. Who knows? To maybe get money. But she seems pretty content with where she's at by not chasing that part of the story, but by being grateful that she got through and she has her answers. She feels more empowered and new lease on life. And as she had said many times over. So I think this is truly such an incredible story of resiliency. And I'm really looking forward to having her on again very soon. As we say, we got to keep it fresh in your mind so that you can remember this story. I'm also going to have her husband on because I haven't had Jace on. And we went to university together and I got to hear his side of the story to be able to support her through such a difficult time. So it's going to be a really good kind of series that we can keep going on this story. But I hope you learn from that. It's probably the most important part of psychology that I've learned so far. What's your story you're telling yourself? Plain and simple. Uh, doesn't make it easy, but what's the story? It's There's a negative in any story. But what are you telling yourself it means? And so I hope you really learn from that in your own story, in your own life, whatever your struggle is. How would that part of the story be the fortune of your story? If you think about any good TV show, any actually good true story, the hero has to go through the difficulty. They have to go through, well, I went through this and this is what happened. And what I always say is it's not that a reason things happen. You made a reason things happen because you were able to take that negativity in your life for that traumatic event event, and make it into something very powerful and potent for your life to serve a purpose. And so clearly Alyssa had done that. I highly recommend you check out her Instagram. And if you are interested in any business motivational mindset and you're looking for someone to push you over some edges that you might not know about yourself, this could be a great person as she's been through it herself. And thank you as a listener, as always, allowing me to help you chase your own passions. And as Alyssa had talked about on the podcast, that people have this idea of, if I achieve this goal then, but you know, from listening to this podcast, it's not about achieving that goal. It's about going after the goal. Because life is not about the pursuit of happiness, but the happiness within the pursuit. And I'll catch you next time.